With that, I'd like to introduce our speaker this evening. Uh, Hans is a good friend of mine, a dear friend I've known for many decades. Um, Hans has a very interesting he started in business education, he studied literature history, uh, went on and became a nurse. He was a diploma nurse uh, from the University of Orlegan. Um, and from that, he worked in pediatrics, uh, specialized in the ICU, and as well as anesthesia. Uh, he was started his perfusion career in the um, late 1980s, and he worked at the University of Lübeck in Nuremberg, and then went on to the Heart Center in Beirut. Um, he was the uh, chief perfusionist at uh, um, a number of hospitals, but primarily um, where he was performing a lot of autologous platelet gel, vibrant glue, and then stem cell sequestration. sequestration. He went on to become a clinical specialist with Soren, and uh, in, in the last decade, he's been an independent perfusionist working on a lot of new, unique applications, and primarily in the last few years in biomedical uh, simulation. So it is a, a pleasure today to uh, have Hans address um, the history of mini cardiopulmonary bypass and some of the challenges and future uh, directions that it will take. So Hans, with that, I will go ahead and shift the screen to you. So please, uh, please uh, go ahead and begin as soon as you uh, can see your screen. So, uh, yeah. I'm trying to share my screen with you. Good. So you can see it, Al? Yes. Good. Thanks very much for the introduction, Al. It's uh, really a pleasure and an honor for me to be on these webinars. I just noticed this afternoon that I was once a former employee of uh, speciality care when uh, life systems was still part of speciality care uh, a couple of years ago. <clears throat> I'm talking uh, to you. Good evening, ladies and gentlemen, by the way. Uh, for me, it's late night, so it's a late night show. And um, uh, I just want to go through my personal experience with mini bypass. And last November, it was one of the first uh, live or, or hybrid meetings we had together from the society in Thessaloniki. And, um, and uh, at this meeting, I was introduced as a dinosaur of mini bypass. Um, I don't find it uh, insulting, but more flattering. So <clears throat> this is my disclosure. And I'm independent, as uh, Al said, it was my own company. I just want to go with you first to through different uh, systems. Of course, I cannot show all the systems which have ever been around, <clears throat> only the most important systems on the market. So you know all these graphic drawing on the left-hand side was such a conventional bypass. And if I'm telling you that on the right side, this big mess is maybe the, the starting point of mini bypass, uh, I mean uh, the uh, development of these mask mounted pumps and the remote controls of pump, maybe this was the starting point of more uh, minimized or more optimized perfusion systems. Uh, during the European board meeting in the year 2006, there was a speaker named Al Stemmers, maybe you know him, and uh, he give, uh, gave already a talk about the controversy surrounding mini circuits in cardiopulmonary bypass. And during this meeting, there was also a comment, and it says extracorporeal perfusion is the most aggressive intervention to the human body. Um, Al, I'm collecting everything, and I collected even this picture from you here. And uh, Albrecht presented the system, and I think it is today even more relevant than it was ever before, because um, the modularity allows the user a relatively free design of the system, and individual components can be inserted. And you have here ultra uh, filtration and leukocyte depletion filters, and uh, with a reservoir. So modularity is the, one of the keywords of the whole story of this evening. I will go later on a little bit more in detail. These are the different definitions. Uh, it was <clears throat> collected in the consensus paper during the meeting in Bern. And uh, you see there are a lot of abbreviations uh, cruising around. And uh, my, my favorite one is not even shown on this chart here. This is MOPS, M-O-P-S. You should know MOPS is a German word for these cute little dogs. I think you in English, you call them poop dogs. And it means a modified optimized perfusion system. On the right side, it's also a statement of this consensus paper made by 35 authors from 24 
different departments and they defined how what is the requirement for a mini system these are all the components i don't want to go in detail on this it is of course a closed circuit it is uh, coded surfaces membrane oxygenase centrifugal pump and on the right side the add-ons which can be added into the system the uh, most important things which is used in a lot of centers in here is the pulmonary artery vent and the pulmonary vein vent so when everything started in the early years, uh, we've been asking, is this a hot lung machine? And uh, on this drawing here from Harald Keller, we, we see already that some components have been added. And this is a picture from the brochure from the cardiovascular system. And I remember a talk in the year 2000 when a surgeon uh, said, this is only the beginning. In the future, we don't need any perfusionists anymore because we have a, a kind of food battle and we can control the hot lung machine by ourselves. But uh, I think we all of us, we are still employed and we have every day a slice of bread and sometimes even a little bit butter on it, maybe. And uh, as you can see on the right picture, so uh, in this original model, they integrated already a, a vent and cardioplegia line and then another roller pump. So it was not like it was maybe planned from the beginning on. So these are the components of a mini ECC circuit and it uh, includes an APC, an air purge control. It uh, should include a venous bubble trap or a vent bubble trap, at least a holding bag for the volume shift. And so uh, there are different classifications of these models. Um, I started uh, very early with this system. This was an, in, uh, from, from Sorin and it was based on uh, um, a combination of a bubble trap and oxygenator, uh, integrated centrifugal pump and an integrated filter. Actually, it was not an integrated filter, it was just an attached filter. And uh, here you see these filter which is surrounding the oxygenator and uh, this little bump here on the edge of the filter, uh, sometimes it brought me to the brink of despair because it was so difficult to de-air. Uh, on the right side is the echo system. This is the system I use uh, at most. And uh, however, this system had also some hurdles because it needed uh, quite a lot of investment in hardware. First, you have to modify a pump. Uh, you have to reverse the alarm function of a pump with an EPROM to make it functional for the APC, for the air purge control. You need a bubble sensor. You need a second bubble sensor, which is triggering the electronic remote clamp, which is shown here. Uh, another system is the MAC system. The MAC system was definitely the first one uh, which was brought on the market. And I remember once a sales rep brought a box to me and said, this is a MAC system. You can use it uh, anytime when you want. So this was my introduction to MAC. And of course, you can imagine that I was afraid to use this. And uh, uh, so what I want to say, it, it was probably introduced in the wrong way. On the right side is a Delta Stream also uh, with an air uh, removal system. Some other systems here, uh, the resting heart from Metronic, and on the right side is a rock safe system from Terumo. Uh, it's a quite nice system. However, it has here this combination of air bubble detector and venous bubble trap. And any time when uh, bubbles are detected, the venous occluder here is closing and the patient is off bypass. And if you have permanent air entering into the system, the patient is quite a long time off bypass. So most probably you have seen this picture uh, before. This is published everywhere. And it is a classification of mini ECC circuits. And they divide it in four different types, type one, type two, type three, type four. And the plan was we start with one, which is a very, very simple basic system. And then we end up with type four. However, my opinion, and not only my opinion, is you should go the other way around. You should start with a type four system, which is quite similar to your existing system. And then step by step, you move on to a type three, type two, or if you want to a type one system. However, only type four and type three are fulfilling the requirements for what we call modularity. Very quick, some pictures about the different types. This is the standard type one system. 
This is used uh, quite often in the hospital in Bern in Switzerland. They use it for cabbage cases, for PFO closures. And uh, what we are doing here as well is we use it for rewarming from patients which are falling, mainly kids falling in water, or uh, patients which are victims of an avalanche accident. Uh, the type two system is a ha air handling system. It includes an air removal system, either manually or automatically. Uh, the <clears throat> air removal system on the resting heart. By the way, this was a nice uh, idea to have everything set up in one frame. And the setup time for this device was approximately one minute. And the core system of this device was uh, the, the air purge control here. Uh, the air was sensed by two different sensors here and on top of, of these air purge control. And the reaction time uh, until opening the valve and removing the air was extremely fast. Here, the air removal device of the Terumo system and also from the, uh, from the uh, Delta Stream system. Type three is a volume management. Volume management means we have uh, a, a back in line with a connection to the line into the patient and, and from the patient. So we can take out volume and we can add volume if, we, if it is needed. And uh, also the, the burn approach is to maintain the volume equilibrium in these patients, especially when they're doing aortic valve surgeries or mitral valve surgeries, they do these all these procedures with a type three uh, system, and uh, they do it routinely and uh, quite successful. Type four includes another reservoir. It is an open reservoir. And as you can see here, uh, we can always convert from a completely closed system into an open system if it is needed. And furthermore, uh, we have another reservoir where we can collect the shed blood or the suction blood from the patient. And finally, we can give it to a cell saver if it is needed. It does not need a reservoir. It can be also a sterile back in a vacuum chamber. And uh, one hospital here in Germany, they are, if the amount of, of suction blood is below 300 cc, they just waste it, it uh, because it does not even fill one bowl of the cell saver. So the conclusion, it is not a mini circuit and a simplified setup but it is a minimal invasive system. And it is more complex, demanding. However, it is more physiological. Make sure uh, perfusion can never be physiological. It can be only adequate. And of course, we expect also a benefit from these uh, systems uh, versus the conventional CPP system. The organization which is now uh, taking uh, responsibility for these minimal invasive extracorporeal systems is called MIEC. And the MIEC was founded in 2014 uh, by a, yeah, quite a, a group, uh, you will see it later on, uh, how the composition of these is. So this is a database from 2020 uh, evaluating about 300,000 patients. And this is the real world. This is, these are the, the major adverse cardiac events in, in cardiac surgery, uh, including the mortality, the prolonged ventilation, reoperation, renal failure, stroke. And this is in, all in all 20%. This is one fifth of our patients. And if you look at these meta analysis here, where we are comparing the mini bypass group versus a control group, we see a significance in the, in the subgroups of the cabbage groups and the AVR groups here. And uh, all the p-values are in a significant range. <clears throat> when we compare now here the uh, minimum systems versus the CPP systems, we divide here in two groups, the modular MIAC group and the standard MIAC group. So the differences are not as big. However, if we see at the right side, and there's a really big gap between the modular system and the conventional CPP system. Uh, I leave this here without any comment. Uh, off pump was uh, a, a huge hype in the in the beginning of uh, 2005, 2008, when I was traveling around, everybody said, okay, the profession of perf perfusion is such a tying species, but we are still alive and we are still pumping our cases and nothing is off pump. Uh, if you look at here at these one year composite with all the endpoints uh, for cabbage cases, and if you compare the off pump group uh, with the on pump group, by the way, this was a really big study, the Ruby study, and uh, it is uh, 
really in a very significant range the differences between off pump and on pump and also these meta analysis here of randomized controlled trials it shows the risk difference uh, for uh, people favoring op opcap and favoring miac also for the uh, risk for stroke for the risk of atrial fibrillation and uh, the blood transfusion and the length of stay hospital stay icu stay and hospital stay in total uh, talking about this safety and efficiency of uh, militarized extracorporeal circuits on a patient group of nearly 23,000 patients we have here the mini bypass group, we have the OPCAT group, and we have the conventional ECC group. And uh, the conclusion is that MAC and OPCAT both improve perioperative outcomes. However, I would see the MAC system uh, not as a, 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 a let's say, a conflict to uh, a conventional uh, ECC. I see it more as an assist device, maybe in the future, for OPCAT uh, procedures. Uh, just as a safety backup and just as an additional tool to uh, improve the quality of the OPCAP patients. Um, this is here uh, another uh, study or this is a recommendation based on the levels of evidence. Uh, we just want to look at the class one, uh, which, are, which are all having a, a evidence level of A. So MIAC reduces the hemodilution, of course, this is what everybody knows and everybody has evaluated in the very early years. The system reduces the uh, incidence of post-operative uh, atrial fibrillation. It preserves the renal function and it is in, associated with an improved myocardial uh, protection. There are also some class 2A recommendations with a level, uh, with an in incidence level of B and uh, another class 2B uh, recommendations, which are also in the uh, evidence level of B. So what, what do we know? What do we expect from a mini system? Uh, I think the, the most important thing is that we are trying to improve the microcirculation on these patients. And this translates into an improved clinical outcome. During the circulatory support, it improves the end organ protection and it uh, reduces, hopefully, in a significant way, the systemic inflammatory response. And uh, these are proven things. The mortality and morbidity of these patients is lower. Don't want to talk about hemodilution and bleeding. And so this is documented in a lot of uh, studies before. So what is the trick about mini bypass? It is to maintain the balance between systemic vascular resistance, the circulating volume, and the cardiac output. I was always in the lucky situation to have the SVR always online every second. You can use your mobile phone to calculate the SVR. And in my experience on the mini bypass cases, the SVR was being in average 100 to 200 times higher than it was on conventional bypass. And of course, it is coming from the uh, anemia caused by the hemodilution on the conventional systems. If you look on the right picture, this is a, a screenshot. When we go on bypass, on the, on the, the, the red line, it's a mini system, and the blue line is uh, the, the uh, conventional system. And uh, these are the first six minutes when we go on bypass. And if you look at the drop down here from the hematocrit from 36, 37% down to 14%, and it goes up and it goes down and it goes up and down again. So you don't need an expensive monitoring. You just go to the side of the uh, anesthetist, uh, anesthetist and look at the face of the patient. There is one moment when you go on bypass where the face of the patient turns white. And uh, at this moment, we took pictures with a thermal camera of the head of these patients. There's one moment, there's nothing else than water in the heart, in the head of these patients. And uh, I think these uh, mixing here is more homogeneous than it is in the conventional system. Uh, I was always looking at the microcirculation and uh, we started uh, relatively early with the device. This one here, this is O2C and with four channels, we were trying to, to uh, monitor the microcirculation. However, it was never finished and I'm not sure whether I can ever finish this one because uh, as Ian Anderson said in one song, I'm too old for rock and roll and too young to die. So uh, conclude this MIAC thing, it is not only the circuit, 
This includes also the peripheral monitoring systems, and it includes also the goal-directed perfusion strategy and the point of care monitoring during these. And this whole thing is not only a procedure, it is a complete package of therapy. Another nice combination is uh, the minimal uh, invasive cardiac surgery together with a minimal invasive extracorporeal circulation. It always takes two for tango. And uh, there are some centers, they are really performing these procedures, minimal invasive mitral valve repair in combination with minimal invasive ECC. And uh, the uh, success rate is really uh, fantastic. Uh, another question is always maybe this is also would also come up is uh, the cost effectiveness and uh, yeah mini bypass is expensive however under the line uh, if you look at these four countries where most probably is the most experience is Greece Switzerland Germany Netherlands um, the there is a benefit, there's also a financial benefit in using these mini bypass systems. It's not only uh, during the operation, it is also the length of stay on the ICU, the total consumption of blood products, of uh, coagulation, uh, substitution, and whatever is uh, needed during a procedure. As I said initially, MIACTIS is the organization, and uh, there are now 407 members, or now even more now, in 47 countries. This is a differentiation of the professions here. And as you can see, this is mainly in the, in the area here in Europe and in the Middle East area, and also a little bit in Australia. Uh, we had several meetings on quite nice places in, uh, in Thessaloniki, in Athens, in Bern. And most important thing is the food in these uh, locations is excellent. And uh, I, I was talking initially, I, I had in mind to talk more about the COMICS trial. However, the COMICS trial, uh, it is conventional versus minimal invasive extracorporeal circulations and patients undergoing cardiac surgery, COMICS. And uh, they had to stop these trial in uh, October uh, 20. Uh, 21 simply because the number of patients in the in the participating centers was too low uh, because of the pandemic yeah so uh, they could not uh, collect all these uh, patients in the time uh, this was the primary composite of 12 post op serious adverse events and uh, they started now a new trial which will be uh, hopefully finished in one and a half years. And it should include approximately three uh, to 4,000 patients. And let's see what the outcome of this trial is. One of the concerns of the most concerns always is the safety of the system. Uh, the MIAC has uh, developed more than 10,500 different records. And at the end, uh, 14 studies have remaining and uh, this is a conclusion of this evaluation and I this but this was done only with type 1 circuits and if we look at the modular MIAC systems the conversion rate to open system is really really low and even more important it has no clinical consequences for the patients so uh, the conclusion contemporary the type 3 mini circuits ensures more physiological perfusion with a modular configuration and this modular configuration creates a kind of safety net so if you want to set up a mini bypass program it is not so important to have a big chief who is uh, commanding everything it is teamwork it's much more important the teamwork between the surgeon anesthesia and the perfusionist and even more important inside of these three groups is communication. Communication is a key for success uh, for these kind of therapy. There are two very nice books on the market which are giving you some interesting uh, results on mini bi minimized cardiopulmonary bypass techniques. And uh, of course, uh, every system, every procedure, every work on a machine has a kind of of a learning curve. And this is the learning curve, which is going through these. You start with cabbage cases, AVR, MVR, uh, and at the end uh, with the type four, you, they do hard lung transplantations, they do repairs and dissections of the aortic arch and so on. Uh, training is the most important thing. And uh, the, we, I'm quite relatively often in Istanbul, in Turkey, and uh, these group from Thessaloniki, they. They always focus quite a lot, uh, minimum a half day on the cerebral saturation and uh, uh, showing how important it is and showing how 
a sensitive, the brain reacts on uh, the minimal changes of the perfusion. And I think that it is very important that the brain is perfused in an adequate way. Even uh, if Woody Allen said once, the brain is my second favorite organ. Uh, in, uh, the, in the center in Kerkrade, we do quite a lot of simulation and we can now uh, connect uh, the simulator with the data recording devices of several hard lung machines. This is the works bi-directional and we can also now integrate a lung simulator. And uh, now I'm working together with two other guys from Germany here on POP. No, I'm not the king of POP, uh, even if I was born in the same year as Michael Jackson, but POP means here a uh, perfusion outcome predictor. So we are collecting the data of the patient before we put in in the simulator the variables on bypass and then we get an alert for an increased oxygen consumption or a decreased oxygen delivery and the result will uh, sh will be shown as in the O2 extraction ratio or eventual in the perfusion ratio. So just a few pictures. This is a fantastic team from the Aristotle University in Thessaloniki in Greece with Professor Anastasiadis and his team. Thanks to him for sharing with me some of his slides and uh, these are some pictures when Apostolos the chief perfusionist when he is explaining a group from Russia here in this pictures uh, how he is setting up the system and uh, so everybody can play a little bit with the, with the system and we can simulate different situations like uh, <clears throat> entering air into the system or sucking air from one of the vent lines and uh, set up here. This picture here, this shows two interesting things. First of all, I was much too fat when this picture was taken. And uh, second, I have a spot of food color on my shirt here. So the conclusion from this team in uh, Thessaloniki is to um, achieve optimal results, you should do experience minimum 50 cases. There were a lot of beginners in the past. They did 20, 30 cases and said, no, no, we don't see any significant difference. And then they stopped the program again. You have to go through a learning curve. And after this learning curve, you will see that it is successful and you will see that it is beneficial for your patients. I like this drawing here from the old Copart lung machine. And with this, I would like to thank Speciality care for having me this evening here, and I would like to thank you all for listening. Thanks. Wonderful, Hans. Thank you so much. It was a, a very, very a good overview of what goes on, uh, what has been uh, developed with the minimally invasive extracorporeal circulation over the past uh, 20 plus years. And I'm sure there's a lot of people um, who would comment that um, uh, a lot of the multifactorial changes that have occurred in our profession um, over uh, decades ha have resulted in a miniaturization of circuitry um, uh, as we progress uh, onward. And, um, and uh, at this point, I'm gonna go ahead and, and open it up for questions. And uh, Shannon, do you wanna begin? Sure, thank you, Al. And, and again, Hans, thank you so much. That was, that was great. Um, we have a, a question here. How specifically does um, the mini circuit improve myocardial protection? Difficult question, but uh, I, I think um, cardioplegia strategy, if I compare uh, Europe with US and experience from different meetings, so the most common uh, strategy in uh, mini bypass is uh, the color fiori uh, cardioplegia. However, I think no one is using the color fiori cardioplegia in the original protocol. Everybody has changed uh, his own protocol in terms of time, in terms of volume, in terms of uh, concentration. So uh, sometimes I think we are even close with these, we call it color fiori, but I think we are even close to the neurocardioplegia sometimes. And there are also some uh, homemade mixtures in uh, some hospitals where I used to work. And uh, the variety of cardioplegia deliveries or uh, strategies is, <clears throat> yeah, is, quite, is quite big here. And, uh, but there, there, is, <clears throat> there are studies which are showing that with these techniques, with the minimized 
uh, minimal invasive uh, strategy in combination with a low dose or mini micro cardioplegia is beneficial for the patient. Excellent, thank you, Hans. Um, a a gen generic question, and then I'm gonna follow it up with one specifically on geography. Uh, Hans, the question that Joanne uh, Marco is, uh, is asking, and, and let me stop for a second and just do two quick things. Uh, we normally have individuals uh, for these webinars who come from all across the world. We average between 25 and 27 countries participating. And I think that's very important because I, what Hans has presented today is one of the, the few uh, technologies in the field of perfusion and cardiac surgery that seems to be bound by geography. Um, and the last thing I wanted to say is uh, Hans is in Northern Bavaria. And uh, right now it's, um, I think, 11.30 his time. So I, I want to uh, appreciate him um, uh, participating at this, uh, this late time. Now to the question. Um, and the question was uh, by, by Joanne Marco is what is the uh, average priming volume? Uh, let's say with a, a phase one circuit compared to a phase four circuit. Um, it depends also, of course, a little bit on the situation and on the setting in the OR. Uh, so in average, I would say it's something around 450 cc in total. And uh, with a with a with a wrap procedure, which is done consequently in some of the centers, we are, or these people can reduce the priming volume down to zero. So it means every, uh, everything of the primary will be replaced by the patient's blood. However, this needs, again, communication, communication with the anesthetist because he has maybe support a little bit uh, with inotropes or with vasoconstrictors, vasodilators, depending on the situation. Again, communication is, uh, is really the, the key to success in, in, in this uh, type of procedure. And Shannon, if I could just follow up real quickly, uh, Ken Huxmeyer asked exactly what you just presented, uh, and that is, uh, is RAP being used with MIAC? Uh, what would you say uh, the percentage of procedures that the perfusionists are wrapping uh, the patient that are using these mini, mini circuits? Uh, if, uh, a, a very easy uh, answer on this question, Al. Uh, if I look, I, I've been quite often in Thessaloniki in the OR, and the number of RAP procedures is 100%. Oh, very good. They, they at, at least they try to wrap on every patient. Of course, sometimes if, it, if it's an uh, emergency, if, if you have to crash on bypass, so then you simply, you don't have any time to, to perform a wrap procedure. However, whenever it's possible, they do it. In this country, 95% of all procedures have some form of autologous priming that are are being used as just as a as a generic number that uh, that is out there, which, Shannon, which, which is fantastic. Oh, sorry. Yeah. Sorry, Hans. Shannon? No, that that's a fantastic number, and and I I, I think this is something in uh, in twenty five years ago. Rap, okay, we we knew what it is, but uh, having a, a long discussion with the anesthetist and. And uh, and the professor wants to go on bypass now and not one minute later, so uh, the circumstances were not ideal for for this. Now uh, I think the perfusionist is much more uh, confident or is much more maybe also demanding uh, against the surgeon and say, wait a minute, we have to do now our rep procedure and then we go on bypass. Thank you. Um, it seems that there's a, um, an up-liked question um, mentioning that in one slide, it seemed as if the MIAC use was possibly contraindicated in Europe. Um, they're asking, is it marketed differently there? No, I would say not. Okay. It, uh, concentrated, not, not contraindicated, concentrated is what- Oh, uh, concentrated, I am so sorry. That, that's okay. <laughs> no, we just want to. I know that's what you meant, Shannon. But uh, yeah. I, I saw you. Hans said, uh, "Geez, I didn't think it was kind of." <laughs> I'm so sorry. That was my fault. No, no, yeah. no, it's fine. Uh, well, there's. I, I think the the, the most uh, uh, adopters of these technology are 
maybe Netherlands and, and, and Germany, uh, Swiss, uh, of course, it is, uh, it's a small country. And, uh, but uh, the interest and the, the experience, especially the experience in this country is really great. And, and uh, the guys in Bern, they are doing from the beginning on an excellent work in research. And, and here in Germany, I, I would say one of the pioneers of MIDI bypass was definitely Alois Philipp from Regensburg, the uh, the godfather of ECMO here, and uh, uh, he did a lot of research and he did a lot of fantastic work in in, uh, in promoting uh, mini bypass, but also uh, looking uh, critical into the into the benefits and and to the advantages of these of these technology. Thank, thank, thank you, Hans. Shannon, were you following up with something? I didn't mean to interrupt you. No, no, no. Just thank you. <laughs> Okay, great, great. Um, Hans, uh, a lot of good questions that are here. I'm going to go ahead and, uh, and uh, ask one by uh, Johnson Anthony. Um, and you did a wonderful job of talking about the hemodynamics, you know, the, the more physiologic nature that we get with, um, you know, reducing circuits. But you didn't really um, focus in on uh, the use of order transfusion. You did have it in one part of your presentation saying if you had less than 300 cc's blood loss that they just discard it. But Johnson's question is really interesting because you talked about SVR and cerebral monitoring. Um, how critical would you say it is to constant have it? And you said you had a constant readout of SVR in one of your monitors. Yeah. How, how important it is to know your SVR at any time? And do you recommend that every one of these patients um, undergo some sort of cerebral monitoring? Uh, first, the SVR, Al. Um, I was really in the lucky situation. Uh, to have these SVR monitoring from the first uh, moment on when we started with electronic recording on <clears throat> on the hot lung machine, and uh, of course in the in the beginning uh, we had no experience in the interpretation of these numbers, and uh, over the time we have learned how sensitive patients are reacting on different manipulations uh, during uh, the perfusion and also on interventions from the anesthesia side with different drugs. And uh, I remember these, uh, in the good old days, these uh, long perfusion with 15, 18, 20 hours on bypass. Yeah, and uh, so, and if you had a look at the SVR on the continuous SVR monitoring, and the SVR was below 100 over a longer period of time. Longer period of time, I mean 30 minutes and longer. I have seen no one of these patients returning to life. Mm -hmm. And um, this is also, in my opinion, now the last one and a half years, I was doing a lot of work with simulation on ECMO. So, uh, ECMO and mini bypass, where is the difference? Marco Ranucci called once mini bypass intraoperative ECMO in one of his uh, publications. And I think also in the ECMO patients, it is interesting and it is I'm sorry, not, maybe not important, but it is interesting to monitor the SVR. Uh, we know that sometimes we, we put volume and volume and volume into these patients. However, they have lost completely uh, the, the kinetic energy. So there is no more force able to move any fluid into the capillary vessels. And consequently, they are shifting from the intravascular space into the extravascular space. And uh, what we are seeing that these patients are swelling and they are having volume everywhere. Even the lymphatic system is not working anymore. And uh, so, and in most of these cases, uh, this is the last choice and these patients are not coming back. Talking now about the cerebral monitoring, it is definitely one of the most interesting measurements during cardiopulmonary bypass and also ECMO. Uh, coming back to Alois Philipp, the ECMO guru here in Germany or in Central Europe, they do a lot of rescue. Uh, they, the team flies out with helicopters, but in the, in the last year, in the year 21, they have collected 96 patients, uh, corona patients, 
COVID patients and they collected these patients at home somewhere, wherever it is. And uh, they put them immediately on an ECMO, wherever they are. It can be on the street, it can be in a field. And there's a wonderful video where they cannulate a patient on the table on a beer garden, on a Bavarian beer garden, very nice video. And, uh, and they fly these patients back. The first thing they ever do while they are cannulating the patients, they just put the patches on the head for the for the cerebral monitoring, just to see what is the, the the initial condition on this patient, and how is the status of the microcirculation, uh, especially in in the brain of these patients. And uh, whenever I was asked in the past, what 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 would you see is the future in perfusion? Uh, is there any significant uh, changes are coming up? Uh, I don't know, uh, maybe once we have an oxygenator in the size of a matchbox and I'm always choking and saying next year we have a tubeless perfusion, we uh, do a perfusion via Bluetooth and uh, it's rubbish, let's get serious. I think the future is better monitoring. We should know at every second during the perfusion and during our treatment, what is going on in our patient. It is not only microcirculation, cerebral saturation, it includes also the coagulation status. And uh, luckily we are in the situation having these uh, heparin management systems, having PEGs and having all these point of care devices available, which enables us to have a better picture uh, what we are, what we have to substitute into these patients, and uh, what is probably the outcome, short term, long term. Thank you, Hans. Um, we have two participants, I think maybe three, uh, with a question um, that says a lot of centers have created circuits that use uh, very low prime volumes, oftentimes less than nine hundred cc's. Isn't that good enough? What would you say is the benefit of, you know, um, using this over just a low priming volume with a full circuit? It is definitely a, a, a very good in a first approach to to <clears throat> to shorten the the lines. I have <clears throat> in one of my flow physiology uh, presentations, I have a picture where the arterial line goes uh, out of the oxygen, it goes down to the floor, it lays on the floor, and then from the floor, it goes up to the patient to the arterial cannula. Uh, you are loving all this has a, it has a serious reason because during the perfusion, when the perfusionist was out for a cigarette, yeah, and uh, the, the surgeon wants to decrease the flow, he simply stepped on this tube, now get serious again. It, it's not choking, by the way. <clears throat> and um, yes, by reducing the the tubes, you uh, Shannon, you can reach uh, in one of the centers we had with a with a, a small oxygenator. Uh, it yeah, I think it was an echo oxygenator. We had a priming volume of four hundred and ninety standard, and uh, yeah, if we compare it to the early years where we had two liters or two and a half liters, I think it's a significant improvement and a, a really a big step forward. Yeah, absolutely. And, and I don't know if you know this, and it might be an unfair question, but the picture that you showed earlier of going on bypass with um, the myic as opposed to the full circuit. Now, do you know, was that on a circuit that do you know the the priming volume or anything? Because I think that that was pretty pretty impressive, um, and makes a great argument yeah. for its use. Uh, yeah. By the way, this was not a drawing. This was a screenshot from a CDI five hundred, and uh, and it. Uh, I I don't actually I don't know the exact priming volume of this conventional system, but I would assume it is maybe something in the range of one and a half liters, okay. uh, compared to a mini system. And uh, this is a. Uh, something really, uh, I, I, I saw these, I saw these reactions of the patients quite often. And, 
And once in, in, in England, we had the chance to look at these patients with a thermal camera and you know the, the, the priming volume has a different temperature as uh, the patient owns blood. So we could make really screenshots and we could show how is the distribution of uh, the priming volume and the blood in the brain of these patients. And it was really impressive because there's one moment uh, when you go on bypass where there's nothing else than water in the head of this patient. Wow, that's just, that's incredible. Thank, thank you. Hans, there's a bunch of questions. I, I'm just gonna ask you for your, uh, a shortened answer on some of these, if you don't mind, and, mm -hmm. and there's a couple of other long ones. The first question is, what are the systems rated to in regards to flow? Are they the same as a conventional system? Interesting question, yeah. Uh, uh, we had a, a, a sender in Braunschweig in Germany, and we had a, a lot of guests coming from all over the world to watch mini bypass in this sender. And uh, <clears throat> this was very open, though. They could walk around, they could watch it, everything, and they can have a look into the patient record. Of course, they saw the calculated flow. And uh, the, the perfusionist, he was going on bypass with his mini system. And uh, let's say the, the flow was calculated for 4.8 liters per minute. He was going on bypass. And when he had a flow of 2.5 liters, he said full flow. And everybody, what? Full flow? Uh, Yes, the, uh, the cardiac index is definitely lower. What is the low limit? I don't know, but it is definitely lower. And we are still dealing with these magic number of 2.4 liters uh, per meter square. And this number is coming from an evaluation from Kirkland and Starr from the year 1955. And uh, it was done on eight healthy marine soldiers. And what we find on the table today has nothing to do with healthy marine soldiers, in my opinion. So we should we should re we should redefine this number, and we should maybe adapt it a little bit to the newer technologies or to the change in our uh, perfusion setup and in our perfusion strategy as well. Okay, this is next. just just a, a kind of provocative yeah. answer. So yeah, yeah. absolutely. Um, you know, with the low volumes that you're talking about, and, and as Shannon had said with the question on a 900 cc prime, um, are you, you are, are these circuits, do they use infrequent use of hemoconcentrators? I mean, I can't imagine with that small volume that you would need a hemoconcentrator. This is a question from Julian uh, Williams. Uh, uh, do you use hemoconcentrators on most cases? Uh, uh, to be honest, on mini bypass cases, it is relatively rare that uh, someone is using a hemoconcentrator. Uh, I was once in the center, I'm not saying in which country it was, uh, the, the surgeon said, okay, um, I, 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 I like this idea with the mini circuits and can I use my, my, my type of cardioplegia? He said, yes, sir, of course you can. I was thinking about Calafiori or any kind of microplegia. And so then finally I found out that he is still using a Brechtschneider solution, minimum two liters in every patient, up to four liters in every patient. So my question, where is the benefit of midi bypass if you fill four liters of uh, poisonous fluid into this patient? I don't know. Maybe, maybe this is science and I don't understand what it's behind. Um, I'll go ahead and ask another quick question, Shannon, if it's okay with you. Um, we know that uh, Myectus has revised their standards and guidelines on minimally invasive bypass, and I believe they're um, going to be published or at least submitted for publication soon. Um, the most recent data on a conversion rate, you had stated that it's rare, but the most recent data um, in a meta-analysis said that there still is a 5% conversion rate. Now, the litigious nature of America versus you know, some of the European countries, mm -hmm. we, we, nobody would argue that it's similar. There's quite a difference. Um, how do you justify using a system that has a 5% conversion rate while conventional bypass has a 0% conversion rate? 
And, uh, you know, and you did mention this, but um, the most recent data does say that it's still around 5%. I know, I know yeah. But uh, you have to look at a little bit more in detail uh, who is who is uh, participating in these. So there are some using the type 1 system. They have a higher conversion rate than the type 4. Uh, I, I could not show because the time was too short. I have more slides i think you have it on your on your on the slide deck uh, which is going more in detail evaluating these different centers different um, uh, publishers on on these data and uh, but anyway i uh, even if you even if you have to convert 5% uh, to a open system it means on the other hand that you are doing 95% with a closed system and this is my uh, I'm saying this since I started with Perfusion. Um, we have Amnesty International, they are fighting for human rights. We have Greenpeace, they are fighting for whales. We have no one who is fighting against open reservoirs. Thank you, Shannon. Um, so a question we have, um, are you monitoring um, DIO2 and its application with these systems? Most people do this, yes, especially with now these more modern or advanced systems where the, the, the calculation of the DO2 is relatively easy. It's, it's not a, a, a big algorithm or it's relatively easy. So, and uh, of course it is, everybody is talking about go-directed perfusion and Go-directed perfusion simply means the relationship between oxygen consumption and oxygen delivery, and uh, I, th I think this will be a, this will be a parameter which will be part of our daily routine. In the in the past, when we had uh, a one and only parameter, which was the venous saturation, these times are over. We we need more details. We need exactly to know. Uh, how the, the oxygen uh, distribution to these patients is. And if you look at the papers of Ranucci, uh, which is having a really strict uh, uh, number, which is 272 milliliters per meter square index uh, on oxygen delivery. And if you are one point be below these number, you are already running into the risk of a renal failure. So I think these are really uh, solid numbers now and we can really rely on these numbers. And um, yeah, I think it should be part of our daily routine, even if I cannot hear these abbreviation TTP anymore, but uh, it is part of our life now. And uh, it, it, will be, it will be the future that we are even more monitoring in, in this direction. I don't know. I don't know in which way, but somehow we will we will find some some other interesting numbers or interesting measurements. Sure. That's a question from Rob Baker in regards to the comics trial that you had elegantly stated. You know, has been um, truncated. And uh, Bob uh, Rob is asking: Are uh, there changes to the protocol? You know, some of the reasons that the uh, circuitry has not been accepted in the states as well as it has uh, in other places is the fact that uh, there seems to be a differential in the um, techniques and the methodology that's uh, going yeah, on. Yeah, the, the methodology has changed, but uh, it, it was discussed um, during the last meeting in November. But uh, to be honest, Al, I cannot give you any uh, detailed information on this simply because I don't know. So they are still writing the, the protocol. They are I think the, the evaluators or the participating hospitals will roughly be the same as in the comic trial. Maybe it will be even extended. So this is a plan to extend it to maybe another 10, 15 more senders or, or evaluators. And uh, as I, I, I'm pretty sure as soon as uh, MIACTIS has a protocol and has uh, 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 guidelines for these trial, uh, it will be published somewhere, and we, we will hear about very, very soon. I think so. Okay. Um, so there's a question about um, 
shear stresses and uh, forces, have they been examined since the um, hematocrit is higher in the mini circuits? Have you at all evaluated the effect on the shear stress and increased levels, possible increased levels of hemolysis with this? Uh, yes, uh, hematocrit is definitely higher. Shear stress, it's not so easy to um, evaluate. I'm always asking uh, perfusion students, uh, are you having a shear stressometer on your head lung machine? They said, no. I said, well, it's clear because it's not existing. Uh, yeah, you, have to, you have to evaluate every single part of the system, of the ox even of the oxygenator uh, about shear stress. But uh, what you're asking, Shannon, uh, uh, regarding the hemolysis rate, uh, it is not higher, it is not lower, it is, uh, it, it depends on a lot of factors, of course, and I mean, if I, if I compare uh, a mini system or a, a minimal invasive system with a centrifugal pump, with a conventional system on a roller pump, and uh, the perfusionist is not taking care about the occlusion, he just set the occlusion, whatever he wants, and uh, so this is comparing apples with bananas. It's, uh, it's a huge difference. Sure. Thank you. Ray, we, thank you, Shannon. Thank you, Hans. And, and we are just about out of time. And I want to thank everybody who's um, used the Q&A session. And I apologize for not getting to all of the questions. Um, Hans, there's a lot of congratulations and thank yous here. I know you're not able to see them right now, but um, uh, on behalf of uh, Shannon and myself, I want to thank you very much uh, for this wonderful summary and for this uh, excellent uh, opportunity to, uh, to address many of the uh, questions that came in. Um, before we conclude, remember, we always are looking for new subject content and speakers. Uh, reach out to, uh, to any of us on this call. We'd love to get uh, speakers. As you can see, we've had people from all over the world present. It doesn't have to be just in, in North America. Uh, our next presentation is going to be on in um, in March on the 16th. I'm going to go over uh, the use of ECMO with COVID. We're just at a 700, 705 cases uh, right now, COVID, and we're going to go over a lot of what we've learned in managing these patients. Uh, I know a lot of people who are on the call tonight are doing this in their own practices, and it surely has changed um, how perfusion is, is being conducted uh, from a, an extracorporeal membrane oxygenation standpoint. So with that, Hans, thank you so much. Shannon, thank you very much. You. Uh, I want to thank Maggie as well. Maggie is our coordinator. And please, if you weren't able to see the whole presentation, I, uh, I hope you can uh, have the opportunity to view this on YouTube. And with that, I'll put up um, and leave this up for just a minute or so. Here's Hans' um, uh, email. And, and, and Hans, great work on the uh, biomedical simulation that you've been doing for years now. Uh, really, uh, uh, kudos to you and your team. Yes, I'm, I'm... I'm, I'm still trying to continue and maybe very soon I I will be live with you, Elle. I have my, my latest toy here and, you know, yeah, oh, wow. so if you, <laughs> you know, you know what's coming. I mean, uh, sometimes I'm feeling old, but this keeps me young and it keeps me excited. So Excellent. And with that, uh, let's go ahead and conclude. Thank you very much. Everybody thanks, Elle. Shannon, bye-bye. Thank you. Bye-bye.